All right, Little Detroit. How's it going? What's up, bro? Hey, I see you doing your thing, man. What's going on, man? What what you working on? Uh, I'm working on an upcoming project that's going to be for pre-order sometime uh, next month um, called O-Life 2. I see you don't have too much stuff on the internet. How come? Um, I had to... I had changed my rap name. Um, my old rap name used to be Mansion, and um, that was back in the mixtape days. You know what I'm saying? Like when CDs was out, um, I was just pushing mixtapes. And um, by the time I changed my rap name to Lil Detroit, which is like a nickname that came from my city, you know, in Ohio, which is Lima, um, I just decided to reinvent myself because during that Chicago drill scene, it kind of messed me up because uh, everybody was caught up in Chicago, and um, it forced, they really forced my hand. I had to change my name and reinvent myself and change producers, everything. Okay. So your name is Little Detroit, but you're from Cleveland? I'm from Ohio, Lima, Ohio, Lima. Lima, Ohio, okay. Well, why the name Little Detroit? Um, It was a nickname that my city had... Uh, at first, people try to say it was supposedly Little Chicago. That's why I got the Chicago stuff on. But it was claimed it was Little Detroit. Um, it was like during the era um, where the gang members was around. It was gang. They came to our city, and they was from Detroit. And I remember seeing some of them when I was young. Uh, they, it was a lot of bloods and, and, and crips and stuff, but they was from Detroit. So a lot of bloods and crips from Detroit came into your city and it was it went bad man it, it was a lot of people dying um and then the crazy part was uh my uncle died too from it you know which i ain't gonna speak too much on you know uh for his kids which is you know my cousin and stuff but he died from that um suppose he died getting killed by a crip okay so Bloods and Crips go to your city, and I, I'm I'm taking it to sell drugs. I don't know for sure why they were there, but you know, at that time, you know, I'm 32 years old, so this happened um, probably late 80s, 90s. But I know in the 90s, by the time I was older, they were still there. Uh, it kind of died down around like somewhere around like 2000. I didn't see them as much. But somewhere from 1990 to 2000, you know, as I got older, because I was born in 1990, uh, as I got older, uh, my first funeral that I experienced, I was like six years old and my uncle died. And people was telling me, you know, it was some blood crip stuff going on. And supposedly, you know, my uncle and some people was in a gang, but, you know, he died from a crip. Okay, so there are bloods and crips in your city then? Not as heavy now, but back then, oh yeah, they they were heavy. What I'm trying to figure out is like, was it bloods and crips from Detroit versus bloods and crips from your city? Or, or were they just kind of like bringing the gang culture of Bloods and Crips to your city? They um they migrated there. I don't know how they end up there. I don't really know why. Like I said, I was a kid, but I did hear stories of um, pretty much, you know, they came there and then people from our city in Detroit didn't get along. And it kind of was like a few, but it wasn't no Detroit versus Ohio type stuff. It was the gangs. And I don't know if that started it because now if um, I run into somebody from Detroit, as soon as they hear I'm from Ohio, they instantly look at me crazy, even to this day. Oh, really? So it was it was a big thing then going on. It, it, they kind of eyeball you. Like, it don't matter what part of Ohio you're from. If you go to Detroit and say you're from Ohio, they look you up and down like it's like a problem right then and there. It ain't going to be like no fight, but they don't want you around. Mm, okay. Did you ever have any personal issues with anybody from Detroit or anything? Nah, not really. Um... Now, when the rap scene came, I kind of had, when I started rapping, I started rapping at like 15, but somewhere around the time I was like about 17, 18, I was still rapping, and then I started dropping mixtapes. I ended up moving to uh, Tennessee, and um, some people on my team was trying to expand doing music on my record label, and they was getting into it with people from Detroit on, on some rapping stuff, though. You know, I, I tried to get okay. it to die down, 
and it got bad like somewhere around like 2015, 16. I ain't going to say her name on here, but she was on my team and she was getting into with them constantly. Man, that's crazy, man. And uh, she, she said your uh, uncle passed away when you were six from this, man. How did that affect you? Um, it, it affected it affected my family real bad because it seemed like as soon as he died, like uh, even at my young age, as soon as he died, everything went bad. Uh, my mom was in the Army at this time, so I was staying with my grandparents when it happened. And my mom got, in the arm, got out the Army around this time. She only did four years in there, and uh, when she got out, coming from Fort Seal, Oklahoma, uh, doing Army type stuff, like— it affected my family real bad. My mom was real messed up, and my grandma took it the hardest. My grandma, she was a musician as well, and after that, she wasn't on no music stuff no more. She was just depressed. Like, our family was torn apart from that. Damn, man. Sorry to hear that, man. But I, I, I somewhat was confused because that being my first funeral that I acknowledged, I didn't understand. I still at that age didn't understand what death was. So I was confused like like he's gone like I, I didn't know what was going on and um I didn't go to the funeral thank God they didn't let back then they didn't really let a lot of kids go to them type of funerals because they were scared like a retaliation but I didn't get to go to his funeral but it, it tore me apart because I never seen him come back through the doors so right then and there I knew he was gone yeah man that's sad man that's sad uh, all right. Well, let's kind of get into your story, man. Uh, you mentioned you're from uh, Lima, Ohio. Lima. Lima. Yes, sir. Lima, Ohio. Uh, and what was it like for you growing up there? Um, it it was rough. Um, um, I I used to live down the street. It was a, a high school called Lima Senior. It was the old Lima Senior before it was a new one. Um, they ended up rebuilding it later on. By the time I was in high school, um. But it was rough, man. Um, our city is like a small city. It used to be a huge population. But somewhere in like 10, 20 years, the population died down fast. I don't know what was going on. I know it was a lot of killings. I lost uh, my sister to a shooting, my cousin. I lost friends. I lost a lot of people to shootings, man, at an early age, though. So so your whole family was involved in gangs then? Nah, nah. My family wasn't really involved in gangs. It was really, it started off being my uncle, and then it was my father. My father did, like, dang near 20 years from me. He just got out a few years ago. So those are the ones I do know of. The rest of the city and people I don't really know, but I know um, I used to see a lot of gangs on the regular. Um, the Lama Center that I mentioned, a lot of my uncles, aunties went down to this high school. It was really down the street. Um, we used to live on Pier Street at my grandparents' house. And the old Lama Senior was really down the street. And um, they used to tell me, don't go down there. And then I used to get on a bike and go down there. And I experienced seeing them. And it's terrifying. it was terrifying, man, because I used to see them. But back then, they had a lot of respect for the kids. So if they seen you, they'll tell you to get out of here. That's how serious they was. They'd be like, what this kid doing down here? They'd be like, hey, man, you need to go home. And they'll trick you and tell you that they know your parents or your mama, and they're going to tell them. So that made me leave all the time. I ain't want to stay down there too long. But I used to see a lot of stuff broad daylight. Like, broad daylight, you know, during the summertime, they'll have a lot shooting with each other. During the summer, while you're trying to go get ice cream off the ice cream truck. How old were you when you first seen your first shooting? Um, I was six years old. Six years old, and you remember it and everything. Yep, I was on my um, I was on my grandma's porch, and um, one of my um cousins went to go get ice cream off the truck, and my auntie was just going inside the house, and one of my other uncles, you know, was I guess trying to get ice cream off the truck for my cousin, and um, my cousin uh, Lil Junie, matter of fact, which is you know my uncle's son. My uncle that passed, you know, that's, this is his son, and um, he was going to get ice cream off the truck. Um, and right when he went to go get ice cream off the truck, you know, a shooting happened. He had to grab him and, and cover him up, pretty much jumped on top of him and cover him up. It was like I was seeing it, and it was like a drive-by, and people were shooting at each other, but they wasn't shooting at them. It just happened right then and there. 
Man. And then my auntie, I remember grabbing my sh- my hoodie because, you know, I had a hoodie on at the time. And she swung the screen door open and grabbed me and pulled me inside. Because I didn't know what was going on. I'm young. I'm not knowing what's going on. I just seen him grab on him and cover him up. And the screen door opened and my auntie pulled me in and closed the door. Sheesh. Man, what is that? And, and what do you think was like the worst one that you've seen? The worst one I seen, the worst one I seen was pretty much, um, which I don't want to speak on it too much, but the worst one I seen, um, I was living over on on on, on 4th Street at this time, and uh, I used to hang out with a lot of people from 3rd Street, and um, I was on 4th Street, and I was going to Perry School, and then um, in the middle of the night, you know, say it's the weekend, my mom asked me to take the trash out, and right when I took the trash out, um, people came pulling up and they had an argument. This right around time, No Limit was coming out, and they was dropping a lot of music. And I heard No Limit playing, the music playing. And um, my mom told me her to take the trash out. We was finna watch a movie. And right when I took the trash out, I was coming in. Whole shootout happened. And I ran inside. And um, as the shooting was happening, uh, I seen somebody, I don't know if he got hit or not, but somebody's body was hanging out the side of the car, and they were still shooting and driving. And my mom came out the door and told me to come inside. But it started being after that, when we was living out there, every time the music was blasting real loud, my mom used to make me go to bed because she didn't know. You know, she used to keep her windows and curtains closed. But when she heard the music playing loud, you know, they used to use that as a cover-up so you can't hear the shooting. So my mom hear the music blasting loud, she look out the window, she'll close the window and everything, tell me it's time to go to bed. And I ain't never understand it at first. And... As I got older, I understood. She used to make me go to sleep right then and there. Sheesh. Um, and nobody got shot at that time? Um, At that time, I know somebody got shot the time I seen it. But I, I don't know what happened to the person. But I know um, I seen him have a shootout, and soon I seen a dude in the back seat get shot, and he was hanging out the window. You know what I'm saying? And it messed me up because, you know, I'm seeing this. But then the weird part was I got so immune to it that I hear a gunshot even if, you know, I got off the school bus. And me and my friends start getting used to it. We'll hear a gunshot and still be outside. We just got used to it after a while. As long as it wasn't so near us, we, we stayed out there planting. So it, it was no joke. Okay, and... Uh, you mentioned your mom was in the service, so you were staying with your grandma. You know, uh, what was it like having your your mom in the service growing up? Um, I, I needed my mom. I know that for a fact because my grandma, you know, my, my granddad been passed before I was born. So my grandma was taking care of my, my two aunties and uh, my other uncles. These are all her kids, so... We were living in a four-bedroom house. It was a big house, but we was living in a four-bedroom house. And it seemed like we was crammed in, like, one space. Sometimes some, some of us slept in the other rooms, and sometimes if it was overcrowded, like if we had other family members stay over, somebody had to sleep in the basement or in the living room on the floor or on the couch because it was too many people now. But it was, like, normal. But I needed my mom because my mom was really, like, the disciplinary, you know, the person that kept me disciplined. Like, you know, you can't go outside this time of day. You got to be inside by this time. You got to eat this, eat that. So when she left, I really needed her. You know what I'm saying? Because she the one that wasn't going to let me play out all times of the night. So really, my aunties kept me in order. See, my grandma, she disciplined us to a certain degree. Like, she didn't tell us, you know, when we go to school, sit down, do your work. She didn't tell us, like, you know, be inside by a certain time. She'll let us be outside at 10, 11 o'clock at night, but my aunties... And my uncles were like, nah, you need to be inside the house. You got to go to school in the morning. So by the time my mom got out the army, you know, that was all that stuff I was doing in my grandma's house getting away with was over. My mom wasn't happening. Mm, okay. And what is your school life like? Um, I went to some good schools. I went to Woodier. Um, I went to Perry. Um, Woody was like my favorite school. I went to Woody. It was like a, a pretty much like a public school. Um, Perry was a little bit more strict. Um, and then I went to Shawnee somewhere around middle school. Then I finished going to middle school 
at Irving. I went there like one year. Then I, I finished going uh, to West Middle School. So I was kind of always, we was moving a lot. Okay. Uh, what was high school like for you? Um, High school was the hardest for me because my mom was remarried for a little while, somewhere around like, my mom got married somewhere around like, I'll say around like 2002. And um, my mom was, date, the person she was dating, she was with him for like pretty much like 10 years, like pretty much 10 to 13 years. And they got married later down the line after my sister passed, and then they got divorced. So when they got divorced, it, um, it kind of affected me because this was the closest person to my father, my stepfather, because, you know, my real father was already locked up. I wasn't able to see my real father anymore for, like, forever, you know what I'm saying? So my stepfather was the closest I needed to a father because my mom was always at work. So if she was at work, I was at my grandparents' house. So, you know, uh, it affected me real bad, um, and high school, it was tough far wise because we lived out the district. We lived in Shawnee area, but my mom had me going to Lima Senior, and I guess she thought it would be a better education. And it was tough because, you know, um, I was constantly in fights. You know, uh, I started getting I started getting into the streets around this time my freshman year because my mom was struggling. You know, she was working two, dang near two jobs. So... I didn't like seeing my mom, you know, struggle, and I thought getting street money was the best thing, and it, it was the worst thing to do. But did you catch a case or anything? I didn't catch a case, but I I, I, I almost start catching cases around my senior year, but my freshman year, my mom kicked me out for a little while. She didn't want me in the house. She caught you? She never caught me, but what, what gave me away was my clothes. I was rocking expensive clothes. Uh, I had got a, I thought I could get a job at McDonald's. I started working there like at 15 and a half. And uh, I tried to use, I wasn't even making that much money from that job. They was paying like every two weeks. So I thought I could be slick and take the checks from that job and try to flip it in the streets. And um, the clothes I started wearing, I was wearing like rock and stuff like that. My mom was like seeing the tags on the clothes. I'm not realizing she going to my room when I'm going to school. And she was seeing the clothes, and she like, how he getting to these, all these clothes? I know he ain't making that much money from no McDonald's every two weeks because she seen my first check. So she was like, and my Rockwell jeans was $300, $400 jeans, and I'm rocking Adidas shoes. It's like a hundred and something. And she was like, nah. And then I started buying my own cell phone. I used to be on her home phone all the time, and when she seen the phone I had, it was like an Altel phone. But Altel was expensive at this time. It was like dang near more expensive rising. And now... She's like real quiet when I come home asking where I was at and wonder where I'm going. And right then and there, one day I just came home and she had my stuff packed and told me I got to go. Like she didn't, she didn't need no explanation. She was just like, I don't know what you're doing, but she said, you got to go. And at the time, my little brother was real young at this time. My brother barely, you know, three, four years old. And um, I didn't want to leave my brother. You know, I was real close to my little brother. And I'm like, where am I going to go? She said, I don't know, but you can't be here. And I was asking her why. Then she asked me, was I selling? And I said, nah. -uh. And she said, oh, okay. She said, well, you got to go. She said, you can't use my iron. You can't do this, can't do that. Your stuff packed. And she still had me in the living room at the time. And then I don't, I don't know if she told my uncle, but my um, uncle Damon had to come get me. She told me I had to go. And that messed me up because... I was doing it for us, you know what I'm saying, at the time. And this is the time she was just going through her divorce. And my stepfather was just looking at me crazy. And um, pretty much I felt like I was on my own right then and there. Because, you know, I'm used to staying with her. And my uncle Damon, he he was cool, but he wasn't as dis like disciplined you as she would. You know what I'm saying? So I was kind of like, what am I supposed to do? Right, so you move in with your uncle, and how does that go? My uncle, he came and went. Like, he'll show up to make sure I'm at school, and then he'll be gone for, like, a few days. Oh, so you didn't really have anybody around you? Not that time. Like, he'll pop up. He'll trick you. Like, he one time he went to see if I was going to school, and um, it was like a two-hour delay. And then I left out kind of late, and right when I came out the door, he was sitting in the driveway. He was like, why are you ain't in school yet? 
And I'm like, I had a two hour delay. He was like, oh, okay, get in the car. But then after he dropped me off, he'll be there some days. But then after that, he gone for like a week. He'll put food, he'll put enough food in the house and everything. But at the time, his son, which was my um my cousin Little Damon, which we called him, um, you know what I'm saying? My cousin Little Damon was in the street life too. But my but the weird part was my my cousin Little Damon was little, like a couple years older than me, and he didn't want me doing that stuff. And he ended up dying probably like around October. He got killed around there. So everything was just my whole all my four years of high school was bad, man. And then um before all that started happening, I started getting suspensions, getting fights at school and everything. And I don't know who told my mom that I was getting into heavier and heavier. My mom came back and got me. Oh, so your mom made you move back in with her. But she, she got me at the right time because supposedly my uncle called. My uncle house got burnt down. And supposedly, you know, this is a true story. Uh, he was staying over here on Eureka. Eureka Street, and his house got burnt down. And uh, I felt bad because my uncle called and blamed me for it because he said right before it happened, some people was coming. He don't know who it was. Some people from the streets found out staying at my uncle's house at that house. He said some kids he never seen knocked on his door looking for me, and they looked suspicious. And he said, uh, he said you know, um, Dave Yon don't stay here no more. They thought, I guess I don't know if they thought he was lying or whatever. And he said he asked them who they was. They didn't tell him who he was. Uh, because the friends I usually had show up was some of my homegirls from Cincinnati. And they popped up every so often. And he never seen them before. So he didn't know what I was into. And then right when my mom came and got me, probably like a day or so later, you know, um, a neighbor said they seen a car pull up. And next thing you know, uh, you know, her glass shattered and his house was on fire. So, you know, he ended up having insurance for it. But I kind of felt like uh, he blamed me for it. He was real mad at me about it. Like, I start seeing him every once in a while. He didn't really want to speak to me. Okay. And so you you don't, you never found out, nobody ever got arrested for it or anything? Nope. Man. Eesh. That's, that's horrible, man. Um, I mean, you had, so you had, so you had some legit beef going on then. Uh, um... I got in, I ain't gonna mention the city, but it was a whole nother city I was into it with. Uh, I used to travel a lot. Like, I used to go to Cincinnati, I used to go to Columbus, I used to go to Cleveland. But it was a whole nother city, which I ain't gonna mention for uh, obvious reasons, you know what I'm saying? I don't want it. People looking into it too hard. But uh, I went through a city trying to make money on their on they corners, and they wasn't having it. And I had some of my homegirls with me, and it started then. They really wanted me to leave and not come back, and I came through their city. And I heard money was coming through there, so I thought I could take my my product and go through there and make money. And that's the people in that neighborhood was like, dog, this is our territory. They warned me once. So, you know, me being hard-headed at the time, you know, feeling like, you know, they trying to bully me, you know what I'm saying? I came back, and then after I left, next thing you know, you know, I had to walk to school sometime. I lived uh, like an hour or something away from my school, so if I didn't catch the city bus, I had to walk. And the first experience I experienced was that, you know, people randomly popping up my uncle's house and everything. Then, you know, after they didn't hear nothing happened to me, you know, um, I started going to school. I'll, I'll go to school and somebody would tap me on the shoulder like, hey, there's somebody on the, in the parking lot looking for you. And I look out there and I'm like, who is those people? So I started being smart how I was moving. And then um, next thing you know, I start being smarter. I'll take the city bus. But then for some reason, something told me to stop taking the city bus. So I started walking. And one day I was walking. I'm somewhere near uh, some called the Bradfield Center. And it's like cold as heck outside. It's snowing and everything. And then right when I got like a little bit on the heel, I heard some shots rang out. And I had to run and jump the fence. And I dang near cut myself. And it was constant after that. So after that, I start walk into school and get shot at either on the way to school or on the way back from school. And then they almost caught me before I caught the city bus because I start catching the city bus thinking that will be a way for me not to be walking. And um, they didn't know exactly where I lived at, but they knew I lived somewhere near that area, which I still don't know how they found out. And um, they caught me on the way to get ready to get on the city bus in the school in the morning. They started getting smarter. So right when I got near... Um, an area, uh, it's an area called Dairy King. It's like an ice cream place, and it's a church right there. 
And right before I caught the city bus, um, it was cold as heck, so it was hard for me to walk. And um, a car pulled up and jumped out, and I had to fight and everything. And people, people on the bus knew I was in a fight because when I got in a fight, whatever, this lady came out, and I guess she was finna call the, uh, call the police or whatever, and I grabbed my, my book bag, and right when I got on the bus, some people that I was cool with from that school was looking at my face or whatever in my head, and they was like, you all right, man? They, first thing my homie said, like, do we got to get somebody? It's like they knew I was in a fight because I guess like I had, you know, my head, I don't know if it was like swollen or whatever, my face or whatever, but yeah, it, it was serious, man. So these guys were coming from another city that you were uh, into it. Up, that you were into it with. You set up shop in their hood, and they was coming at you every day. Not every day, not like on some everyday stuff, but like kind of like every other week. They was they was they was smart too. They was organized. See, I wasn't organized at the time. I didn't. I had people I knew that I was cool with. Like I, I was cool with some people at the time from South Carolina, L.A. But I also had some homegirls from, like, Avondale. They was from Cincinnati, from Avondale. And they start having problems, too, because, you know, um, one day I was on their porch, and I was at my homegirl house, and uh, a random car drove by and uh, shot the house up while we were standing on the porch, and uh, she got shot right in front of me. And we had to get her to the hospital. Me and her uh, sister had to get her to the hospital, and uh, we didn't have no car at the time, and the hospital wasn't too far up. But it was it was winter time. It was like a December, and we had to put her arm around her shoulder and run her up the street. She dang near died on us. I had to keep tapping her face to keep her up and everything. Then we had to drop her off, like nothing happened, because you know doctors ask questions. We act like we didn't know who she was. We just dropped her off at the emergency room, and we left. And we had to change clothes and everything because we had blood on her shoulder. We had to. It was like a store nearby, a clothing store nearby, and we ran up there. It was like a, like one of them hood cl uh, uh, clothing stores, and we went in there, and the people inside the place was looking at us, or whatever, and we bought some new shirts and clothes and got rid of, cause we didn't want no evidence coming back to us. Okay, and are you? This is all happens when you're in high school, right? All this happened in high school. This is just high school. So now, do you graduate high school? I graduated. Um, I did um have to take them state tests. But I didn't, um, I, you're going to laugh when I say this, I purposely um, I purposely failed one of my state tests, so I didn't have to walk the line. I did graduate, though, I retook it that summer, and then my diploma got sent in the mail. But it was for r random reasons, like it was a lot of reasons. I didn't want to walk the line and get my diploma. I, I, I ended up getting my diploma sent in the mail, so I passed all my classes because the teacher was like, you passed all your classes, but you only passed four out of five state tests, and she knew how smart I was. And she's like, why he failed his test? It was like she knew I failed on purpose, but I failed about a few points. And I retook it that summer. And then, you know, I, I passed it. Then they sent my diploma in the mail. But they still was going to let me walk. I had my cap and gown and everything. But I made some reason up and told my mom that they wasn't let, let me walk. And my mom was like, well, why would they let you get your cap and gown? But really, I didn't walk on purpose because, you know, I had beef going on. And I didn't want them catching me at the graduation. Cause they 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 really with it. So I figured if I went and walked and they knew I was graduating, you know, a lot of people passed them flyers out showing who graduated their names on it. So I did it on purpose. Damn. Okay, so you graduate and what do you do with yourself? Are you still on the streets? Do you try to go straight? Do you try to get a job? Um, that summer I was that summer in two thousand nine, I was still in the streets, but I moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee like in August, but right when I was moving that, that whole month, like a little bit before like August, it was like pretty much like the end of July, it was a lot of stuff happening, like I, it was a lot of shootings happening, and then I was getting my name brung up, and um, the feds start kicking in my homies' doors, and they came to my house and arrested me a couple times too, they were trying to question me and see if I'd tell, but I, I wasn't on that. You know what I'm saying? But my mom was telling me, you know, you did something wrong. You know what I'm saying? We leaving you. if The day we move, if you ain't with us, you get left. Oh, so your mom moved. Yeah, my mom okay. was moving uh, to Tennessee. First, she was moving to Hendersonville with my Aunt Cresha. My Auntie Cresha was hearing what was going on. 
So she wanted to really get me out of there. So she told us we could all, me and my mom and my brother can come move with her. But she told me, if you bring that stuff down here, you got to go. And the same week, well, actually, it was the first two weeks, somewhere around uh, close to August, that we was going to leave. The feds start showing up at my door like heavy. Like, down there every other, like pretty much every couple of days, knock on the door, arrest me in the middle of the night, bring me down to, uh, to the police station. And if I didn't give them no information, they just left me down there. And then I try to call my mom's, and my mom, she ain't coming to get me. So one of my um, homies that got locked up, you know what I'm saying, his mom took me home. You know what I'm saying? But they just kept messing with us. They kicked my um, homie door in and trashed his house. And they kept saying, you know, we heard your name come up a few times. Something ain't right. Every time a shooting happened or something there, your name come up. So they start watching me. So I stopped talking on phones and I cut my cell phone off everything until I left. I was paranoid. I didn't let nobody come to my house. I stopped going over other people. I just really just stayed in the house. Okay, so but you eventually move. Yep. And what is the like when you move? It was way better, but I moved to Chattanooga. Chattanooga was like the 90s of my city all over. I moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, it was better, though. I, I I loved Chattanooga in the area because the area I was living in, I was living in a place called uh, uh, Rainbow Creek Apartments. At first, we was finna move to Boone Height, and Boone Height was real bad. So we ended up going to Creek, and then um, I used to go out by East Lake and East Dale with some people I knew from the city at the time, and... Uh, it was way better because nobody at the time really knew me. You know what I'm saying? So I was getting to know new people. Only person I knew from Tennessee at the time was Calico Jones, but he was in Memphis. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I've been knew him since I was 15. He was like an artist. He was a few years older than me, but he was a rap artist. He soon was with um, Soldier Boy. And you know what I'm saying? He was had a label called Switch Gang at the time. Is this when you start rapping more? I start taking it more serious. You know, at the time, I w I've been rapping since I was 15. I used to uh, have battle raps at school all the time. And I had my own record label called Ohio Gang Records. I, I had everything Ohio that I was doing. And um, it was called Ohio Gang Records. And I was had these females that was rapping from different cities on my team. But I didn't know how to do the music industry. I didn't know nothing, pretty much much about it. So I didn't take it that serious. I used to battle rap at school, and that was about it. And sometimes I used to go on 4th Street at my cousin's house and, um like record songs at his crib. He had like a little studio in his apartments. And by the time I moved down south, I, I kind of took it more serious because I seen Calico make it. So when he made it and he was telling me like, bro, stay out the streets and get in the studio, you know, I started taking it more serious when I seen him do it. Okay, now that you've moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee, are you going straight or are you still kind of getting in, in trouble? Um... I, I, I wasn't as bad as I was before, but uh, I was working a lot of nine to fives. I kind of gave it up, but I was still hanging around people that was in the street. So, you know what I'm saying? That ain't a good deal, but uh, I wasn't getting as much trouble. I got in a few fights here and there down here, and um, I, did, I, I did get shot at like probably one time. I, you know what I'm saying? And then I came back around, did some dumb shit, but that was like several years ago. I ain't on that no more, but... When I first came down here, I didn't know the city enough, so it took me like a good year or two to start knowing the area. Because any any place I move, I learn where all the stores at. I learn the neighborhood, the area, where the gang, you know, where the gangs at. I learned it for a reason, so I know where I'm at, you know. So I know my surroundings, because I can't sleep at night not knowing. So really, the first week I moved to Chattanooga, it was people in that neighborhood didn't know me, and I was walking around the whole neighborhood, but I wasn't trying to go see people. I was trying to know my environment know what type of type of people I was dealing with because, you know, my little brother, you know, was living with us for like the first year or two. So he he stayed with us. He started staying with his father probably like around somewhere around 2011. But he was going to school with uh, down there for like a good year or two. And um, I was really trying to protect my brother. So I was learning the area for him to make sure he was going to be safe. Did you ever go back to your hometown? I go back there all the time. I just came. Um, I just came from there probably like two or three weeks ago. What's it like now when you go back? Um, My city is, is, is like a dead city, man. Um, We used to have like a roughly 70-some to 80-some thousand people in our city. Now, 2023, it's probably roughly 30,000 people there. It decreased fast. So a, a, a lot of abandoned buildings. Abandoned houses, 
jobs then left, factories gone. Um, was really there is still like I think a plant, like a chemical plant there, and um, a lot of people drive out of town to work for I think for Ford or something like that. But it's not too many jobs there, and ain't too many opportunities. It's still a lot of restaurants. It looked like they're trying to change things up and do the roads and bring jobs there. But people sleep on my city. They think because it's a small city that is that is safe. It's it's dangerous, man, because you can't do nothing without nobody knowing. You could go out there and do something by you, you and another person can get into it in a city. And nobody could be out there, but somehow people will figure out what was going on. That's how small the city is. You can't do nothing to nobody without nobody figure out who did it and who it is. Yeah, I hear that, man. Okay, well, uh, you know, one of the things that's really been in the headlines a lot lately, especially, you know, in the hip hop world, is there's been a big debate about people who tell on the dead. You know, I think uh, Terrence Gangster Williams, Birdman's brother, was like the person who really kind of kicked this off. He came out, he did an interview with Vlad, and and really kind of told his story and how he ended up getting out of jail was by telling on murders that his dead friend's done, man. You know, how did you feel about all that? Um, I was disappointed. You know what I'm saying? Even though I don't know him. But where I come from, man, you can't you can't tell it all. It's, it's various reasons why. That you, first, you don't you don't want to tell on a living, and you don't want to tell on a dead. So you gotta think about it. you tell on a dead. The people that's still living that run with them is the people you need to uh, worry about. You get what I'm saying? So, for a perfect example, and I only knew this that happened once. I knew a person from L.A., and it's a true story. I was in high school. I knew a person from L.A. He died. He was in that street life. And when he died, his homies put the bodies on him. Because, you know, he was dead. It's a true story. And um, the result of that happening was his sister, you know, they were staying with their auntie. And um, his sister, you know, you know, now he dead. Sister, you know, his sister don't have no brother. They was only like a few years apart. So she was going to middle school. And what happened was the result of that was they thought they could be slick and say, you know what, since our homie dead, let's put the dead bodies on him. Well, the deceased, you know what I'm saying, they family or people from their hood, you know, a lot of people are real revengeful. So how they feel was, well, even though he did forget that, they wanted to get some get back, even though he was dead. And uh, the sister said they had to constantly fight. She had to constantly fight at school because the deceased that heard that their brother then killed their people, they people going to the school with her in L.A. And she had to constantly fight. Then she said sooner or later, her and her auntie had to move because, you know, they, uh, they, they, they car got shot up. So when you tell on the deceased, you got to worry about them families in their hood still won't get back. Because even though that person dead, how they feel is they might be able to forget that. Because it's going to make them look weak. They're going to feel like if they don't spin back around, they hood look weak. Then you got people in their ear like, oh, you know, I heard such such killed your people and y'all ain't do nothing about it. Oh, yeah, he did, but you know what I'm saying? They, they, they pressured to do something to that hood, even though he gone. Those are the those are the results. Like, I feel like if you do that street stuff, just keep your mouth closed. Like, this is the reason why we got lawyers. You know, even though they try to play that good cop, bad cop stuff, which, you know what I'm saying, I, I don't fall for that stuff. But I'll never tell them living or the dead. And then you got to worry about, too, you tell on that, you know, your family going to pay for it, your kids going to pay for it. That's why, you know, even with Takashi's situation, you know what I'm saying, He's still living, but he got to worry about, you know, his key is paying the price for what he said. He should have just kept his mouth shut and just did his time. If you don't want to do no time, just get out the streets. When I got tired of the streets, I left. I just left the whole game where it was at. But, you know what I'm saying, I didn't go out no rat. I didn't go out, 
you know, telling on my people, I ain't do none of that. I got a good name in the streets. I stand on my stuff. I don't play no games. But when I got tired of it, I left. But that don't mean, even though I left the streets, that the people I was still into away from that other city, they still can't spin back around on me. I'm 32, and even when I go back to I still keep my eyes open. Some of them still laugh. Yeah, I hear you, man. But whatever he did, you know what I'm saying? He got to live with a bad name. I don't know people. You know, I only know a couple people from Knife War. But uh, whatever Gangsta Wills do, he told his story. I mean, that's his life. I can't go out like that. Sometimes if you go through all that, you leave the streets, even if you come out with no money and no nothing, at least have a good name. If you mess your name up, that's it. That's why, you know, 50 doing a show on Big Meech, because even though Big Meech got locked up, you notice his son got the role in the show because why? He got a good name out here, even though he ain't got nothing left and he locked up. But what if he had a bad name? His son, Lil Meech, would be getting targeted. You got to think about the whole cause and effect. You tell the effect is, okay, this person deceased, and you see it happen all the time. People don't know this, too. I used to work at uh, Harlem Memorial. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Let, let me throw something in there, bro. Let me, let me play devil's advocate, man. Go ahead. Uh, just because you tell on the dead, that doesn't mean that they don't already know who did it, though. They could already know who did it. That's that's true. But you still you still giving your deceased homie a bad name because you got to think about it. Yeah, the streets talk, but not everybody going to believe it. Let, let me ask you a question. If you died. Would you be OK with your friends putting the bodies on you to save them from doing life? No. Really? Heck no. I'm going to tell you something. I, I grew up on Third Street. Tell it is not. If you, you tell, you can't even come back around there. Third Street ain't nothing to play. It's dangerous around there. You, if you from, like I grew up with these people from there. If you tell, you are not allowed to step back on the premises, man. It's, it's for various reasons. Like, like if, you, if they put them dead bodies on me and people believe it, you know, my mama, my brother, and my auntie's in danger, bro. I'm worried about, I'm worried about my family. But, but, but. That could have happened either way, though, right? Because even what if you got caught for it and you're in jail? If I got caught for something I actually did, even then, even then, you know, I'm not going to put nothing on my homies and I don't want them putting nothing on me. No, no, I'm just saying, let's just hypothetically, you got caught for some shit. You're not even there to protect your family. You're in jail. Your family's in danger. That That is true. So, so, so why even put your family in danger if you're worried about that particular scenario? Well, when I did that street stuff, you got to think about it. I was young at the time. But even when I was young, I, I knew the street code. But when I got tired of that, I got out. You see what I'm saying? I'm not doing it now. But when I was younger, I knew the rules. I was out there. But the best way I protected my family from it, like I said, I kept it on the low. But I didn't have all my business around, around my creed. I, I didn't serve out my creed. I didn't go around... You know, boasting and bragging about stuff. I was so low key about everything. You know what I'm saying? But even by the time I was in that street where I was into it, some could have still happened. If I'm pretty sure if my little brother with me, they pulled up, some could have happened. But I used to move around so solo because I knew the consequences of what I was doing. It could affect other people. People would tell you towards my senior year, I didn't let people come to my house. I didn't come around people as much. I was walking around by myself most of the time because I knew if it pulled up and happened. You know, so even if my mom said, hey, you know, you had to go over your friend's house, would take your brother with you. And I'd be like, nah, uh, uh just in case. If you do that, you got to know the consequences come with it. Now, I understand what people saying. Oh, this person already dead or this person doing life. Just put the bodies on me. I understand that because, you know, that's saving them. But if you feel like you're going to tell, just don't do it at all. Because then you, you may never know, bro. I'm going to give you this scenario. If I'm locked up. And I take them bodies of them people that you kill. What if they got somebody that they family or people, they friends from their hood in that, that, that prison locked up. And they hear about, oh, I heard you, you know, you killed such and such. And they be they people. I'm going to be in there fight for my life every, every day. I'm about to get moved. Well, especially yeah, especially mean, if you're from like, true. especially even though I'm from Ohio, especially if you're from New Orleans, L.A., don't people revenge for, bro. Sometimes people will kill you even if they think you did it.
You know that for a fact. It's been innocent people killed that didn't do it. But just somebody hearing that they think you did it and one person out there crew that's with it, they're going to knock your head off. I'm just trying to, really, my thing is to try to keep my people safe. But I feel like at the end of the day, bro, just snitching not tolerated with me, man. I'm 100% on it. I'm not telling on my dead people. I'm not telling on the people that's living because I, I might put they people in some stuff. If you can't do the if you, you can't do the time, don't do the crime, bro. If you ain't built for it, just stay out of it. Because that's what come with it. Is keep your mouth shut. And, and, and if you get you get if you want to fight that case, get a good lawyer. And if you still get some time, do your time and come home. But if I feel like I can't do no time, I'm not finna be out there at all. When I got tired of that life, bro, I literally left. I left the whole before the hypnotized with hatred that Boosie was talking about, I've been left in 2009. Because I want to get away from it. If I was still living there, I probably wouldn't be sitting here with you. I'd probably die by now. I know a lot of people that died from it, but it's a whole world out here. I left. I moved out the whole state. I still visit, but I moved for my own sake. My auntie gave me a chance to change my life. She said, how are you going to do music and chase your career when you, you know what I'm saying, you beefing, you know what I'm saying? I took heed to her warning. So I said, you know what, you're right. It's a lot going on. I can't focus on being in the studio. I moved down south, changed my life. Plain and simple, man. If you just want to get out that life, just stop doing it. But if you feel like you're going to tell on a deceased person or a person living, just know the consequences come with it. Not everybody going to believe that, bro. Like you said earlier, sometimes the streets still know who did it. So you can lie all you want, but now you put you in danger, your family in danger, and the deceased. Some people revenge, but they can't find them. They go, okay, I, supposedly this dead person did it, so we're going to go after his kids. And I'm going to give you a scenario. My father, he did almost 20 years doing that gang stuff. He was really in the gang. He don't do it now. He like on some preaching stuff. But I remember several times I used to ask my father because my father didn't barely pick me up. And I'm not making it. This when he was out the first before he went in and did all that time. And I said, but dang, you know what I'm saying? I asked my dad after he got out. And I said, dang, dad, you barely came around picking me up from my ground. Why you do me like that? Now I'm older. And he said, man, I had to protect you. I barely put you in the car because my dad said, you know, he got shot at. I never knew my dad got shot before. My family never told me, never said he was in a hospital. This is when I was a kid, like right the time my uncle died. He got shot too in a different situation. And he said he couldn't pick me up as much after that. Because he said, if I put you in a car and they do the drive by, you in the back seat, you get hit too. So my father said, hey, I didn't want to take care of you. Your mom was living right, being in the army. Your, grand, your grandparents, your aunties wasn't living there, but I was. So he said he had to distance himself from me. He, he stopped by every so often and he dropped off Jordans. He gave me clothes. And then he'll just disappear for weeks. So I'm thinking he was abandoning me. I thought he was just dropping off money because my mom was on him. But he said he, he was living a gang life. He said, back then, no people can't find their kid, your kids too. So as I'm older now, I understand. You know what I'm saying? Because he said, I, I want to distance myself for your safety. Now I constantly talk. Now he out of prison. I constantly talk to him. I see, and you know what I'm saying? I haven't seen him in a while because he been, you know, he live in another state. But he come around a lot more now. Cause he ain't living it no more. Well, I don't know if you, you know what I'm saying? You get that, but everybody has their own opinion. Maybe some people feel like that's a strategy. You know what I'm saying? To say the hood, say they people, oh, this person dead. Let me throw them bodies on them. That's smart, but you just got to think about the consequences from it. And you got to think about this too. That could build a Rico, man. People don't know about the Rico. So if I, if, if, let's, let's say I get locked up, right? And I go to court. The court is grimy. They paint a bad picture of you. So the first thing they're going to do, they're going to pull up everything that you have done. Then they're going to pull up a whole chart of all the people you hang with. So that you're going to go to court. And, you know, I, I salute my homie J-Bo for this, but he went and did five years. He never gave none of us up. But he told me even when he went in there, they were bringing us up. And he said he didn't know who none of us was. So if you put bodies on the deceased, next time... One of y'all fighting the case after you get out again, you go fight another case. They can start building a Rico because they say, OK, all these people he hanging with dropping all these bodies. You say you're a good person. You're trying to do better. But look, at all these people used to hang with, killed all these people. did, And then they're going to bring this up. You told us 
that your homie, your friend that you hang with, killed all them people, right? Now it's like you got to say it again in front of the court. And then if you say no, they be like, oh, so were you lying? So did you? Or So you see the, the cause and effect, it get worse. They could build a case, they could build a RICO off of that. Because you pretty much said, your people killed these people. It's just like you can't see the strategy that the police use, but in the long-term effect, everything shatters, man. Young Thug going through that right now. Even though I don't know Young Thug, but they said they was building a RICO case on him for years, and he didn't even know. Because all of the deceased people that died and all the people up till now, they used everything, bro. Just because your homie dead don't mean they can't use him in court. They going to say these are the people that he associated himself with. Now you sitting in the court looking stupid like, dang, I ain't put them six bodies on them. And now I got a, a, a new charge. They going to put all that together. You can still catch a, car, a charge with a deceased person. You get what I'm saying? It, it just get, it just, I don't know if you, you know what I'm saying? I don't know how you grew up or whatever, but I just know how I grew up. How everything get bad off that street stuff, bro. It, it all come together. Like my homegirl, like I told you before, that got shot. Did you know she didn't do nothing? She didn't do nothing to them people. But they caught me on the porch. And they slid on, slid seeing me out there. And they see me on the porch. And they did a drive-by on us. And she got hit instead. And I'm living. So imagine if I'm dead. And then somebody see her down the street like, hey, that's one of his people. They'll be on some other jumbo. Let's slide on her too. It's an old saying, birds of a, fe a feather flock together. You don't have to do anything to be a target. Just a, of some association of somebody else that did something. That's why I'm glad that we talking about this, bro, because it just get, it get worse and worse. It, everybody around you get hurt. Even though the street, streets is stupid, it's just... It was a young thing I was into because I, I didn't go out there to beef. I went out there to make money. But the money, the money ain't good either. Now I'm older. You can't do nothing with no legal money. You can't buy a house with that legal money because you got to put it in your name. You can't put a, a, a legal, uh, you can't uh, buy a, a, a car with a legal money. You got to register that car, go to court, put that in your name. That's why street people try to be smart supposedly and use somebody else to put it in their name. But it's still stupid because the money don't add up. Believe it or not, bro, the government ain't done, especially with the IRS. They can see you buy a $200,000 house and look at your record and be like, dang, this dude never had a job. He ain't got nobody's family that's rich. Who, how he get this house? How he get this car? All right, they going to start watching you right there and there, but they going to let you buy it. You can't even do nothing with fast money. That's why I got a job. Off my, off my first interview off the porch, people slandered me for telling the kids and the young people to get a job. When I was trying to tell them for a reason, because with illegal money, you can't, you can make the money, but you can't really do nothing with it. You can't put it in your bank account. You can't buy a car. You can't buy a house. All you can buy is jewelry and clothes and buy more product and keep making more money. But if you don't believe me, look what happened to Pablo Escobar. He, he had a dang a jungle, pretty much. Look what happened to El Chapo. El Chapo, he, 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 he worth a billion, but can't spend it. Can't do nothing with it. Look at uh, Al Capone. All uh, Lucky Luciano, all them people back in the day, all them big bosses, you know what I'm saying? They didn't have no good ending because you can't do much with fast money. They, they, they paint this picture like, oh, you get in the streets, I got a million dollars, but it's illegal. It's dirty money. And once the government find out that money dirty, you get hit with tax invasion. Yep. So I tell, I tell kids out there, get a job, man. And if the job ain't paying you enough, find a job that's paying better. I had a lot of, uh, since I moved down south, I had a lot of jobs that was good and a lot of jobs that was degrading. When I'm working there making, you know, my rent six fifteen, but I'm making seven dollars or something hour, and I'm madder in the mud, like, man, but then I found the job that was paying me fourteen fifteen. But people gonna look down on me like, oh, you know, you rap this street stuff, but you got a job. I already lived that already. But I can't be still currently doing it and rapping. I'll get killed. I won't be able to drop out. Can't can't do both. I hear you, man. Well, I wanted to touch on a few other things, man. Um, I seen that you had something to say about the downside of ownership in music. Yeah, there's a huge downside to it. Um, the labels, I'm going to say this, the labels, they smart, man. Um, 
like I told you earlier, I had a, a record label called Ohio Game Records. And I was learning the business. I dropped a lot of mixtapes back then. I dropped like a, a um, mixtape on live mixtapes back then called Mr. Ohio. That was my old rap name. Long story short, I put all these females on my team. They rap or whatever. And the downside of it is I, I started trying to get connections. I start off, you start off getting producers. You start off finding studios. You get a graphics out. You get a DJ. I had a DJ from North Carolina, DJ Ben Frank. That was my first DJ that was helping me get my mixtapes on, live mixtapes and helping my whole team out. Um, the downside of it is when people find out you own your music, they don't want to help you because they feel like they can't profit, if you know what I mean. So right now, if I get signed, what's the first thing the label do when you get signed? They give you they producers, they give you they studio, they engineers, they give you they DJ, because they got all the connections. They own these studios. They own everything. So they make they people that work under them work on your album. You get what I'm saying? But when you're independent and you find your own producers, own studio, whatever, and you go to a radio station like, hey, play this, they don't know the, some of the record labels on the radio station. Like, man, I ain't finna play that record. Or I had experienced something probably about, you know, before my producer passed away, my producer Fallout Beast passed away in 2018. Um, me and him experienced a lot with the downside of ownership. So what happened was he sold me 100% of the beat. He didn't care at the time. This was at the mixtape era. So all we cared about was getting mixtapes out. Well, it was a specific song I had called Bad For You, and it sounded like it was a hit record. So I had a chick named um, Lele jump on there. She was from uh, South Carolina. The record was hot. So I pushed it to the club in Atlanta first. They was liking it. So I'm like, all right. So I found this promoter out of Connecticut. He claimed he was going to play it on the radio stations. They play it all through the clubs. He had a big connection. What he did was he caught, he had me send a CD in in the flash drive. So I sit there eating. So I'm thinking I'm finna be on. Me and my producer fall out like, yeah, we about to be on. He calls me back, and the first thing he says is, he said, hey man, tell your um, he said, I don't know who your producer is, but um, uh, actual producer, can we play this record or whatever? And when I tell him, I'm like, bro, the record is mine, I own it. He has like a, he he stops right there and there, like, uh-oh. And that was it. So what happened was he's like, oh, all right. He hangs up, never heard from him again, never got the plays in the club. I couldn't, I couldn't reach back out to him. He wouldn't answer. He, he gave me the runaround. And then a lot of these other DJs act like they didn't want to spend my record, even when I was trying to pay them. And I'm going to give you another scenario. I went through this, too. I thought I was the only person going through this. A rapper named, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of him, um, I think his name Tay 600 from Chicago. He said when people were shooting his videos, everything was cool. But as soon as he started trying to pay to own the video, to put on his channel, the dude didn't want to shoot his video no more. And I went through that as well. That's why I'm not doing music videos. I'm doing nothing but interviews and dropping music because if you try to own that and put it on your channel, they don't want to work with you. It's like they want to, they feel like if you pay them the upfront money, that's all they get. Which, which really is what it is. Unless they ask for a percentage, but who's going to give them a percentage some just because they shot a video for you? So a lot of people feel like they ain't getting that long-term royalty money they not trying to work with you. Produce Some producers do it too. I had a producer recently. I tried to buy a beat from him. And even when I was trying to give him 50% of the record. And I said, hey man, I want to own my masters. The masters is the beat that people don't know. The masters really is the beat. I was like, hey bro, I want to own the masters to this beat, bro. Um, you know, I don't want to own 100%. I'll give you 50%. I said, but I want to own the full exclusive rights and the masters. After that, when I said somebody owned the masters to that beat, he was like, no, nah, I'm not selling my copyright. And he ain't want me to buy the beat no more. I don't know why they do that, but I just experienced it. And me seeing Tay 600 from Chicago doing an interview probably like a few months ago, he said, man, I tried to pay the same video producer that shot all my videos, finally pay him money for a video to get shot for my new album. And he, he said, dude, didn't want to do it at all. So he had to find somebody else to shoot his video. Even when he's trying to pay him. It's stupid to me because I feel like that's a long-term business relationship. And then that artist will go brag like, hey, this is the person that shot my video. It brings customers. But people in the industry don't look at it like that, man. They look at it as I get paid this and that's it. Did this person make a hit record? So so hold on. I, I didn't see the interview. But was so so the guy was shooting the video for free. And he was taking it, uploading it to his YouTube channel, and he got to collect all the money. 
And that was the deal that they had. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, if you do a million views, I mean, you're talking about four to five thousand dollars. So, See, I don't know that because I never, you know, so, yes, yeah, so, so, so why would he, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, the, the, the camera guy's looking at the shit going, you, you don't probably, Tay probably only want to pay him like 500, maybe a thousand to shoot the music video. I don't know. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I ain't in this business, but. Videos don't cost definitely don't cost more than a thousand, especially because they, you know, their videos are pretty, you know, they're just rapping. They got their homies in the background. You know what I'm saying? They got some guns. There's not no real special effects or anything going on. So I'm pretty sure he ain't paying more than a thousand. So shit, that that uh, the videographers probably looking at that shit like, nah, like nah, man, shit. I want. I'm trying to make that four grand. If I'm trying to make that four or five grand, bro. I don't want to just get no little five hundred thousand dollars. Right, like, like you know, oh, so pretty much they they get the long term money off the views and the, and, and the subscribers off that video, and then they got a certain type of content for that artist. That that makes sense though, because I, I can't I can't see it from their point of view because you know I don't never did a video, but that makes sense how you described it. So he he looking at the upfront money as a loss. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, for a tape, for a tape, I mean, tape probably gonna at least do a half a million views. Minimum. Definitely. Video. I'm pretty sure he did a mill on his last couple videos. So, I mean, yeah, shit. You know? Um, yeah, man, that's... So, so do you think that's still bad, though? Like, like that, that artist that's independent got to go through that? Like, DJs? Especially nah, bro, you, you should, you should find, find somebody to, to shoot your music video and put that shit on your page. Absolutely, dog. Don't, don't let nobody upload your music video to their page. Never. And that's coming from Cam Capone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Never, never, bro. I, w I would never do. I would never agree to that, unless it was like a, like a lyrical lemonade situation, or unless you were doing it to expand your fan base. You know what I mean? Like if if you know, like I'm from Cali, right? So if I was popping over here in Cali and I wanted to expand my fan base, then I might do that with a guy from Chicago. That you know makes sense. Just, just to expand my fan base to Chicago, so so I, I would take you know small losses here and there, you know what I'm saying to expand my fan base. But I mean, for the most part, ninety percent of my videos would go on my channel. Absolutely. That and see, this is an interview, so heck yeah, I want my interview. You know what I'm saying? Upload it on your channel. But video-wise, a lot of artists want their videos on their channel to get them subscribers and have people come they come their way pretty much. But it's pretty much like, you know what I'm saying? It all depends on the person you're doing business with, I guess. How they feel about it, you know? If I was if I was that guy, I would have still shot the video because it would still have his name showing that he shot the video. You know what I mean? But I guess he ain't look at it that way. But I don't know them in particularly. But I just seen it, and I, I was kind of like, "Dang, I'm going through that." But right now, my strategy is I'm just doing interviews right now to get my name and face out there. Then I'm gonna drop projects, and then if one of my records take off, that's gonna be the record I, I'll probably do a music video to. But so far, I ain't doing no music video. I'm just trying to get on big platforms, do interviews, and, and then um, I got a second EP coming out that's gonna be for pre-order by uh, next month. So. That's just my strategy right now because I don't have nobody behind me putting money up for me. I put money up for everything. Even though I know Calico, you know, but he'll tell you, I've been doing this on my own by myself, running my whole record label, my team. Right now, um, I got an artist from L.A. Um, named Lay Baby, and um, her, one of her, fa her father was Whack Deuce. He was with the Outlaws, with Tupac back in the day. And, um, you know, right now I got her sitting right now, so I told her when I get on a little bit more, I'm gonna help her drop a project. So she really the only artist I'm working with right now. And then um, I might soon, you know, later down the line do a feature with Lady SK. She from Chicago. Me and her real tight. Uh, she's still doing her own thing. She don't really do features like that. But me and her cool. Um, but so far right now, man, I'm this. This is my strategy, man, to get on. I just hope other artists take heed to what I tell them about the streets and just nothing wrong with it. Go get a freaking job, man. You know, it's just a lot of people look down on people got a job because the industry paint this picture of people rich and jewelry and cars and all that. So I don't know if it's because the females or whatever, but dude, like, man, I ain't finna work that job. Like, you know, back in the day, in our grandparents' era, uh, uh, having a job was like the best thing ever. If you say you had a job, people looked at you like you was rich. 
But now in my era, they ain't having it. You say you got a job, and the female look at you like, what you mean you got a job? Like, man, get on. You know what I'm saying? If you ain't got no big money, they ain't trying to hear it. <laughs> like, man, go back to that 9 to 5. Get out of my face. You ain't got no coupe. You ain't got no Lamborghini. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. It's a different world. <laughs> you ain't got a million followers. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know people that got a million followers, but they ain't got a million dollars. But they'll still be like, oh, he got a million followers, though. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, man. But I, I appreciate you, too, Cam, having me on this platform, man. You didn't have to do it, but you did it, man. I always see your platform. Never thought I'd make it to be on here, man. Well, man, that's what's up, man. I'm glad you got to tell your story. You know, uh, you you know, you got a wild story, so you know what I'm saying it's definitely dope, man. I wish I never went through it, but you know, maybe God got other plans for me, man. Out the whole, out my whole city in my state, you know, I'm sitting right here, you know what I'm saying. So maybe I was bored to do it, but I um I can't wait till next time to do an interview with me, man. Uh, it'll be cool, man. Maybe we we'll have some more better things to talk about, cause. Uh, the streets is cool, but I don't like talking about the streets stuff too much. But I, I'm glad we touched base on it. So I hope the kids take heed to it, man. If you just ain't, you ain't built for the fire, just stay out of. Get a job. Get a job. Go to college. There's nothing wrong with it. If people call you a clown for it, just realize you'll live longer. <laughs> I live longer than everybody that didn't leave the streets alone. I'm 32. I'm proud of it. I lie, you know. Well, that's what it is, man. That sounds like a good way to end the interview right there, man. Appreciate it, man. Stay out the streets. Get a job. Get a J-O. How you say it on Friday? Get a J-O-B. <laughs> job. Get a J-O-B. <laughs> All right, man. Good. Go, dope interview, man. I appreciate you. Appreciate it, man. All right, bro. Yep. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone news.